Hello and welcome to So What You're Saying Is, I'm Peter Whittle. Now, with the Tory party averaging about 20% in the polls at the moment, uh, the chances of it really disappearing seem to be gathering. Of course, there are the smaller parties, which we talk a lot about on this channel. I'm very pleased uh, that uh, my guest this week is Richard Tice, who is leader of the Reform Party. Um, thanks for coming. Great to be with you, Peter. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, fantastic. I wanted to ask you a lot about reform, but to begin with, uh, in at the deep end, we take this week, we've just had census results out, and they've caused some controversy you know, over the past couple of days. They show that actually in London and in Manchester and Birmingham, uh, that it is now minority white British. W what's your reaction to that? Look, at the end of the day, we came out of the Brexit party, and the Brexit party was all about essentially doing what the people voted for, which was to leave the European Union. And as part of that, it was about taking back control of our borders, our laws and our money. And what we've seen just in the last couple of weeks with the, uh, the, the lawful immigration, uh, it's almost like an explosion, actually, mm -hmm. that the number was 70% higher than at the time of the December 19 general election. So the immigration numbers have not been taken back control by this Conservative government. They're actually going up and up and up. And, uh, and the consequences of that are being felt and seen everywhere, uh, whether it's trying to find affordable housing for one's children, trying to find a GP, a hospital bed, a school place, a dentist appointment, uh, social care places, all of this, uh, the simple fact is the population of the UK has exploded in the last 20 years yeah. without any consultation or discussion with the British people by our political masters and leaders. Mm -hmm. We're up some 10 million in the last 20 years. And if you had had that discussion and people said it's the right thing to do, for example, you then plan for it. But we haven't, and we haven't planned for it. Mm. And that's why now we're in a terrible state in almost every part of our society, our culture, and our infrastructure, and our economy. Yes. And it's, it's really serious. And look, I always say, we always want to welcome lawful immigration that works for our economy, where we've got genuine skill shortages until we can train our own, of course, that's absolutely the right thing to do, and it can add value. But if you have unlimited, low-skilled immigration, such as we saw from 2004 onwards with East European accession countries, what actually happens is you have zero real wage growth. And I'll put some numbers on it. In the 1990s, we had real wage growth in this country of 2.8% a year. Over a decade, that's about 30% amongst friends. Between 05 and 15, we had zero real wage growth, zero. So a 30-year-old plumber would be 30% worse off mm -hmm. than his confrere from 20 years previously. Mm -hmm. And that's really significant. And that's why, uh, essentially, we've had no real wage growth. People don't feel better off. And then we've had the cost of living crisis and so on and so on. So now we face the worst of all worlds where essentially the population has grown out of control. The Tories now admit, the current Home Secretary, Sorella Breverman, admits that the system is broken. She admits that uh, they've lost control of our borders, not only lawful, mm. but also, of course, uh, unlawful, mm. illegal across the channel. And let's just look at the detail of, for example, the Tories uh, points-based system, which was designed on what Australia had mm. for uh, lawful immigration. I've actually read it. Mm. It accounts to 230 different job types, 800 plus job titles. Mm. The average, the salary goes down to just over £16,000 for a seamstress. That's half the average national salary. That is not a sensible skilled worker visa policy that is not in any way that is a complete open borders 
all comers welcome, no ifs, no buts. Over and above that, you've got the student visa system where not only the student can come, but any part of their family and dependents can come as well. And then after graduating, you can stay for two years. Then you apply for your skilled worker visa. So we've got a system of open borders at the moment. And as I say, it's affecting every part of our society. And essentially, reform is the only party now that will ensure that Brexit is delivered properly, that we do it properly, whereas the Tories have betrayed the whole basis of Brexit. They haven't cut taxes, they haven't cut regulation, they haven't controlled our borders, mm -hmm. they've let us all down. We can sort all of those things, and the opportunity for Brexit is still there, but it has to be done by someone who believes in it, who understands it, and will get it done. See, uh, it's interesting, when you say about the, the Tories uh, admitting to having lost control of our borders, for example, um, it's sort of now appearing that it's not even just a question of lost control, that in fact, while saying one thing, they actually were liberalising and liberalising restrictions. So in fact, actually, it's a massive deceit. Wouldn't you say that's the case? It's a complete deceit because they've designed this skilled worker system, this points-based worker system, and they've designed it to be a complete open door, all comers welcome, no ifs, no buts, no checks, and good luck when you get here. And the result of that is what we're seeing today. It's absolute chaos. And the very nature of our country, people are looking around and saying, what on earth has happened? What's going on? Mm -hmm. Nothing works. Mm -hmm. We're all getting poorer for a multitude of reasons, including our energy policy, which, is, which has been nothing short of gross negligence, this mad net zero policy that's making us net colder and net poorer. Mm -hmm. And so, and on it goes. And all of this is because I don't think the Tories know what they're doing. I'm not actually sure they believe in the very concept of uh, British sovereignty as a positive, constructive uh, thing for which we should all be incredibly proud and want to drive forward and be ambitious and make it better and better. Because be under no doubt, Peter, we are a great nation with an incredible history and heritage, amazing assets, wonderful people, but we're being badly managed, badly led and badly governed. And the result is, as I say, we're getting poorer, it's chaos, and nothing works. And this, after 12 years of Tory rule, mm. when one of the main reasons people vote for Tory is because of that old sort of negative mantra, well, if you vote Labour, it'll be even worse. Mm. Nothing could be worse yes. than what this Tory government has done to this country that we love yeah. in the last 12 years. I think actually that, yes, that mantra, uh, and indeed you know, that kind of blackmail that's used for people at election. I think that's not going to work this time, funny enough, uh, well, in, in two years' time. Um, just for this point, uh, you say about the point system and about Brexit, uh, making Brexit work. Um, I think what, it might have come quite late to some people, but what appears to be uh, strange to them is that regardless of Brexit, um, the general immigration system could have been change before, I mean, regardless of our being in the EU, um, th that in fact control could have been there when it comes to outside immigration, because we're outside of the EU. Um, but let me, let me stop you there. Why, why privilege EU citizens yes. over and above our Commonwealth friends and partners, for example? Madness. What we want is the best, the brightest, with the right skills where we need them. But even better is to make sure that we train up our own best, our own brightest. We've still got a cap on training doctors. Mm. Ludicrous, utter madness. We're still requiring nurses to get degrees and burdening them with, uh, with um, student loans. Again, completely unnecessary. We're having to bring in engineers and software developers. We don't need to do this. So we can train our own people. Mm. Let me just remind people, we've got 5.3 million mm people living in this country on out-of-work benefits. That's one in eight of the working age population who are being paid to sit on their backside at home. And yet we've got CBI, big business, 
people like Lord Wolfson of Next saying, we need to bring in even more cheap, low-skilled uh, people from overseas. Why? Because they don't want to pay a proper living wage for British citizens. They don't want to, they don't want to pay it. They don't want to train our people. And I think they need to be told very clearly, very firmly, this is going to stop. Yes. How would you, what actually would you do, what would reform do then uh, when it comes to the current points based system that you say that you went through? You know, what would you just scrap that? What, what would you do? It, like many things to do with the current government, it actually needs starting again. It's mm -hmm. no longer fit for purpose. Mm -hmm. It's a joke. Mm -hmm. It's a farce. It's a complete open border situation. I'll pick up the, the £16,000 example for a seamstress. That is literally almost encouraging a sort of slavery yeah. for someone working in textiles in the back streets of Leicester. What on earth is going on? Right? So the whole thing needs to stop. The next thing you need to do is both to deal with lawful immigration and illegal immigration is accept the Home Office is not fit for purpose. It's not recoverable. You've got to start again with a completely new Department of Immigration that is staffed by people who believe in the cause. The moment you do that, everything changes. So you you'd have a separate... Completely start again. You, mm. Some things, are, it, they're too far gone. It's a bit like a knackered old building. You're better to just demolish it and rebuild a wonderful, gleaming, shining, trendy new thing, okay? Right. Real estate's my background, that's why I sort of understand this stuff. <laughs> we'll and so, uh, so, for example, on illegal immigration, the, uh, the, the crisis across the channel, we have got put forward a six-point plan, which is based on the successful uh, track record that you saw in Australia, where, first of all, you make it uh, very clear that nobody, but nobody, will be allowed to settle if they in the UK if they come here illegally. Okay, That's the first thing you do. Uh, the next thing you do, you have to leave the European Convention on mm -hmm. Human Rights. Thirdly, you set up a department, as I've just mentioned, of immigration. Mm -hmm. uh, the fourth thing you do is that you say that we are going to uh, pick up safely uh, people in the dinghies and using existing laws properly, because all the laws are there, they're all there, yeah. you use existing laws to take people back to France. And we're entitled to do that, but what that requires is a border force that believes in what they're doing and political leadership that is determined to get it done. But see, this is the, this is the point. You say at the very end of the year, political will, right? And also this point about the border force, um, I think it was the former head of the border force uh, came up with some extraordinary statements a, a while ago saying we, we hate the idea of borders and all this kind of you know we're all citizens of the world something like this um, people do get in completely perplexed as to how you know we can have a border chief saying that I mean how did he end up with that job exactly. you know all of this sort of thing you have to employ people mm. who believe in the concept mm. of borders who believe that it's right to know who's coming into your country and who's going out of your country. Mm. It needs to be the sort of immigration department that you see in Australia, that mm. you see in the USA. Mm. And look, we, can, we are a welcoming nation, but we do need to know who's coming in and who's going out. All our numbers at the moment are completely up in the air. Mm. Um, and the other point about uh, the, the final point of our policy to deal with illegal immigration is that you have offshore processing centers so that uh, people know that um, they will be dealt with quickly, promptly, but they will not be allowed to resettle here. Right, right. And that deals with it and it stops it. And guess what? The track record is there, the proof is there, the mm. evidence is there. It's what Australia did. Yes, they got a bit of international flack, but they're still doing it even now under a Labour government. Um, you mentioned there about training people up. Uh, this is the other side of this whole story. Um, I know, obviously, you haven't probably got detailed, you know, uh, uh, points, you know, already. 
prepared. But how broadly would you do that? How this is a massive task, isn't it? How would you do it? Uh, the, the the key thing is that there are too many people going to university, doing frankly useless degrees, coming out with a pile of debt that they then can never get on top of. And they've been sold a false dream, a false nirvana. A, a much better way of doing it is, again, look at what worked. It worked when you had firms that had a responsibility to train up apprenticeships. And, and so that people leaving school or college at 16 or 18 are being taken on by firms and trained on the job, whatever it is, whether it's manning a lathe uh, in a, a workshop or whether it's uh, training to be a nurse. When I was 18, friends of mine who trained to be a nurses, they didn't go and sit in a classroom for years on end. They went into the wards under matron and they learnt on the job. It's that sort of common sense approach. And that then actually gives people a taste and gets people out there, gets people into, uh, into work. And that's the right thing to do. But we're in such a serious situation with these 5.3 million people on out-of-work benefits, which is one and a half million more now than pre-COVID. There's almost no checks and balances. And yes, of course, we should always look after the vulnerable, the genuinely medically ill, uh, the disabled in a, in a, a, a sensible, proper, uh, responsible way. We always have done and we always will do. But of course, there are many wonderful people who may be disabled, but who are working well, whether they're working from home or whether they go to work, and that's great. But you have to incentivize work. Work is a great thing. You know, the, the sense of satisfaction and achievement and dignity uh, and self-worth that, that benefits you, that is best for your health, for your families, for your children, as an example, for your local community, and ultimately for our economy, is massive. And if we got, let's say, 2 million of those 5 million, 5.3 million back into work, the saving on our benefits bill is 20 to 30 billion quid mm. every year. But because the Tories don't want to talk about that, they don't want to recognise it, they just want to import cheap, low-skilled labour, then we've got a tragedy of talent being trapped in basically in the benefit system. You know something has dramatically gone wrong when business people come up to me and say, Richard, I've got people who are on relatively low paid work who are resigning to go on benefits. Mm. That is the definition of a badly designed system, which is why the, our economic policy is, is absolutely founded on growth. Mm. Whatever you think of Liz Truss, she was right to engage in the discussion about growth. You can't tax your way out of this crisis you tax your way down the plug hole. You've got to grow your way out of this crisis, and you do that by motivating and incentivizing people to go to work. So you cut taxes hard for, uh, for the lowest paid, the least well off, and you cut taxes hard for small businesses. We would free up six million people from paying any income tax whatsoever by lifting the threshold from 12 and a half grand to 20 grand, or just above. That does a couple of things. It incentivizes work, and it makes work pay relative to being on benefits. It's a massive, massive switch there. And uh, encouraging small businesses, no small business earning below 100 grand a profit should pay any corporation tax. Just invest in growth. That's how you stimulate growth. And how do you pay for it? You pay for it by cutting a load, load of completely daft things. We keep being told by the renewable energy folk, the eco-zealots, that renewable power is cheaper than, uh, than traditional power. Fine. Well, presumably you no longer need the 11 billion of inflation-linked subsidies for renewable energies. So that's 11 billion. You get a couple of million people back into work. That saves you 20 to 30 billion. We're all looking at our household budgets and saying, crikey, cost of living's gone up a bit. I could do with saving five quid and 100 out of my household budget. Small businesses are doing the same with their budgets. What about if the government, literally every manager of every spending department in every quango, local authority, government department was told, you save five quid and a hundred, you can't touch the frontline services, and if you fail, guess what? You're fired. Because that's what happens in business, and government should run the country like a lean, well-run business, then 
all of a sudden you save another 50 billion quid. I mean, very soon you talk about serious money. Yes. So you can afford to cut taxes hard, go for growth and pay for it by cutting out useless government waste. There's only two types of government spending, Peter. There's useful mm. and there's wasteful. And tragically, we see far too much waste and not enough productive, useful spending. And you see all these lots of little examples. But you know, if you look after the pennies, the pounds mm. look after themselves. So we stand for high growth. Our economic plan, it's all on our website. We've just put out a, a, a new detailed document. We've got to grow out of this crisis. You put the foot fl hard on the accelerator in eighth gear, you cut out wasteful spending. And the thing about higher growth is you get higher wages and with all of that, you get higher tax revenue over the medium term that pays for better, properly reformed public services. Uh, just for one point there, I mean, you, you mentioned his trust and, and, and going for growth and et cetera. But um, it was one of, her, one, of her, one of her ways of doing that was actually by further liberalizing migration, wasn't it? That was her intention. And she was completely wrong on that. Mm. So she believes, like most Tories, in open borders. Yeah. And uh, that, that is just, that is not in the best interests yes, uh, of the British people. Mm. What is in the interest of the British people is to get higher wages. We've got a productivity crisis. Why do you think that is? I'll tell you why that is. Because businesses are not investing in capital equipment to replace labor when it gets too expensive. That's how economics works. I mean, it's literally basic A-level stuff. If you can't afford the price of labor, you invest in capital to replace the labor. That's how the combine harvester mm. was invented, for heaven's sake. Mm. If you can't afford the price of fruit pickers and apple pickers and vegetable pickers, which we've been able to do because we had low cheap labor coming in, then guess what? You'll design machinery to do the job instead. That hasn't happened because we've had cheap imported labor. And you know that's why we've got a productivity crisis. You extend that, you keep importing cheap labor. No. Let wages grow, go for growth, keep immigration really, really tight, lawful immigration, and that way, but then you say to people on out of work benefits, there's a carrot and stick. You get into work, you'll earn more. Mm. But rather like we've just see, heard about in Italy, if there are jobs out there and you turn down a job, there's no such thing as a free lunch, my friend. Mm -hmm. Actually, your benefits will be cut and cut until you realise that it's not fair to ask other people to pay for you to sit on your backside. A huge area, uh, it's called culture war and all of this, but I mean basically what you might call not strictly economic issues uh, preoccupy people more and more, uh, particularly people who watch the, the channel. And you know, they want answers really to questions such as, you know, why is my child being taught X at school, for example, or things like this. Why is it now seen that the you know uh, the kind of woke onslaught has pretty much gone through all of our institutions? I mean, what is your approach to this? Do, do you think that I mean the Tories have been simply not just useless? Um, I just feel that they don't even understand it really. They think it's kind of political correctness gone wrong, you know. But I mean, what would you say when people they are getting more and more concerned? The children, for example, are being taught critical race theory in schools, the gender theory. What would reform do to counter that? Uh, look, there's no question the Tories have been utterly incompetent. They've been totally asleep at the wheel. What they're brilliant at is talking the talk. Mm. You get all the warm words, the waffle, the spin, oh, we're on top of it, we're going to sort it. We're bringing a new law. They've had their time, yeah. 12 years. They failed. They failed the whole country and this insidious uh, activities and culture, these things that you've just mentioned, this, this woke wally absurdness has seeped through uh, our society. It's seeped through all the institutions and it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I think for most people, it doesn't get more serious than in our schools. Yes. And it's got to stop. And it has to be made. And again, you have to make it crystal clear. You just ban it. You're not allowed to teach critical race theory. Right. There's no such thing as white privilege. 
Right? You're not going to teach this gender critical garbage. No, it's not allowed. It's going to be against the law. And if you do, you'll be fired. Yeah. It's the only way to deal with it. It's got so serious. It's so endemic. You have to take it on absolutely full frontal and say, no, enough is enough. What you're actually doing with these theories is you are sowing division in a society that actually is not divided. It only becomes divided when you sow this nonsense mm. in people's minds. Mm. Children, children, they, they don't see, they don't see different skin color. They don't see different ethnicities. They don't need teaching this stuff. Mm. They, they see play, they see happiness, they see learning. And that's what they want to do. No, it, it is it is one of the biggest areas which I think more and more people are becoming aware of now. It started off as just like tabloid fodder maybe, but it's pretty much swept through the whole country. What's interesting, I think, from the point of view of anyone who would call themselves conservative, I mean, would you call yourself a conservative, for example? I mean, Well, well let's be very clear. I am not a conservative in the political party sense. No, no. Uh, but I would consider myself socially conservative, socially conservative. for sure and uh, extremely patriotic and a great believer that we've we're an incredible nation we can still get it back but we are heading towards we're heading towards a waterfall and when water goes over a waterfall you ain't getting it back it's gone it's irrecoverable and you, how near are we to that waterfall then we're within a decade mm. we are within a decade of the whole thing being lost, mm -hmm. finished, mm -hmm. game over. It is that serious. Mm -hmm. And I think people are waking up uh, across the piece and for a whole bunch of reasons uh, on these cultural issues that you mentioned. And that has seeped in very slowly as well as economically and cumulatively, that's the effect. And we can still be a confident, proud, high growth nation where things work and where our children can thrive and be, be amazing ambassadors for our country. But roll forwards another decade of this nonsense. It's quite interesting because, you know, it was always a, a kind of truism that, uh, you know, younger people started off kind of quite left wing and then be kind of came more conservative. Uh, you might have seen the poll with those YouTube, um, sorry, YouGov, but also uh, Eric Kaufman for Policy Exchange recently, showing extraordinary left-wing views amongst like 18 to 24, vast majority of them. I mean, th this is a kind of existential problem for any one on the, what you call center-right, right, right or whatever going forward, surely. I mean, that the, these they have been to a huge extent indoctrinated maybe. Um, you know. uh, to a sense, yes, by by what they've learnt mm. in schools mm. and by the suppression of genuine free debate, free speech, free thinking, mm. uh, that is true. But I think actually the worm is beginning to turn. And interestingly, for example, just in recent days, uh, there's been a YouGov poll on whether there should be a referendum on net zero. And yes. actually, those uh, on the left, young and, and young people on the left, They've got genuine concerns about it as well. And there's quite a lot of people who would like to have that debate mm. and a discussion about it. And I think that this is going to, the whole net zero thing and energy thing is blowing up in our face as we speak with horrific consequences. And I think is going to be a huge part of the debate over the next couple of years. We are the only political party at the next election, where we're going to stand across the whole piece except Northern Ireland, 630 candidates, I've already right. got 560, so we're not mucking right. about, right. and we're not standing down for anybody. Let me reassure everybody on that. You're not and standing we're, down We're not anybody. standing down, we're standing everywhere, so we're standing up for Any ourselves. alliances though? Uh, we've announced, for example, we might have joint candidates, so we've announced we would have some joint candidates with the SDP, SDP. because actually in, in certain areas they've got key people, and, and actually on, on some of these key issues, we're, we're very aligned. And what about, say, Reclaim? And, uh, you know, likewise, if Lawrence wants to stand some candidates mm. in some key areas, then then we could have a joint candidate. That's I'm, a sensible joint working. Mm. 
And you know, Lawrence is doing amazing work on mm -hmm. some of the key issues mm -hmm. we've just touched mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Really, really vitally important. Because this is something that comes up all the time. People say, why can't the smaller parties get but together? The, uh, but the thing is, look, it's really hard getting going. I mean, mm -hmm. interestingly, Nigel phoned me the other day, said, Richard, and it was the day we got to 8% in the polls. It took UKIP 19 years to get to 8%. Mm. It's taken us 22 months. He said, remember this day. The following day, we got to 9%. And polls bounce around. But we're making progress. It's really hard for small parties. With first past the post, people think it's a wasted vote. And so I'm saying to people, look, we can, we, we can have joint candidates. But fundamentally, you know, we're driving forward. We've got a full agenda. And we're going to stand everywhere. Mm. And we're committed to that. Mm. I know how it works. If, if, you, if you don't stand everywhere, you're not taken seriously. Mm. You have to stand everywhere. People have to believe. I do a talk show. People say, are you standing in X or Y constituency? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. Mm. Everywhere means everywhere. And we have to do this. But on this net zero thing, we're the only party that will challenge the, what I call the net zero matter. So we all care about the environment. We all want cleaner air in our towns and cities and villages, but we've got to be strategic, it's got to be affordable, and it's got to be proportionate to the global emissions that we produce, which is about 1%. China's about 30%. What we're currently doing is we're literally cutting our nose off to spite our face. And what happens is we're ending up, the more energy we import from overseas, the more we're sending our jobs and our money overseas. Mm -hmm. And if we're not very careful, the only zero will be the amount of cash in our children's bank accounts. Yeah. Just think about this. When you buy energy from overseas, what happens is you send them your cash, they send you the energy, you burn the energy, week later, you've been warm for a week, great. Then where are you? Mm. Where's the cash? The cash is overseas. It ain't coming back. You now need to buy some more energy from overseas. So you see how all your cash is disappearing and you've got no assets here in the UK. If you use your own energy, we've got, we've got decades and decades and decades worth of fossil fuels, North Sea oil, North Sea gas, shale gas, coal, lithium. We should be using all this stuff. Not only would it create, keep our jobs and our money here so that the money circulates around the British economy, yep. which is vital for growth, but also you actually save emissions. Who knew? We're importing 5 million tonnes of coal from all over the world, mm. creating massive emissions mm. as you ship it here halfway across the world. We've got a century's worth of coal under our feet, for heaven's sake. Here we've got new technologies for extracting it cleanly and safely. We're not investing anything like enough in carbon capture so that the emissions from fossil fuels, we can then stick into the caverns underground. That's where the investment in technology should be. Mm. These are the sort of things we should be talking about. You're not allowed to talk about this. I get more vitriol and attacks talking about net zero than I got on Brexit. And the reason is because of the vested interest, the money involved. Mm. And so at this election, people have a very clear choice. Let's assume it's at a couple of years time. And sadly, I think we're going to be poorer by then. We're going to be a lot colder. And here's the other thing. What happens to elderly people who are terrified of their heating bills when they get colder? Sadly, some of them will die. Yeah, yeah. Literally, net zero is ending up killing older people. Why? Uh, you, you've got two, two years, right, uh, until probably to the next election. Uh, why do you particularly do this? Why are you leader of the Reform Party? Why, you know, when, when did you become interested in politics? Is this a... Because, I mean, you weren't an MP before, were you? No, I've never been an MP. So, I mean, was this something that just came about originally from Brexit? or, or I've what? always had an interest in how the country is run, in politics. Mm. Believe it or not, I actually wrote a three-page letter to Gordon Brown back in about 97 as he took the mm. Chancellor's office, saying, for all these various reasons, please do not join the Euro. So, and I was involved in the campaign not to join the Euro. So, look, it's always been in my blood alongside real estate. But I always took the view... I wanted to try and be successful in business, earn a few quid, and then see if I could get stuck into helping the country be run in a better way. And I ended up running a big multinational listed real estate group. We had a good run until 2014, but you can't really be CEO of a big 
listed company right. and right. do politics. I knew yeah. the referendum was coming, wanted to get stuck in. So essentially, I stepped away from that and got stuck in. And then essentially, sort of one thing led to another. And you, you never quite know where things mm. are going to take you. And after the December 19 election, in a sense, I thought maybe, maybe Boris is going to get this done properly. And mm -hmm. it could be 10 years of a proper Tory government with, uh, with a big majority. And they would, they would do the things that they promised, as it turned out, of course, albeit slightly distracted by the pandemic. Th but they've, they've reneged on everything. And we are where we are. And I just think yeah. that look, it does what it says on the tin, reform. There's so much that needs reform. I've talked about the economy. We haven't really talked about reforming the public services. Why do we accept waiting lists of months and months and months? Most Western nations don't. Where's the ambition amongst the political class to say, zero waiting lists? It's doable. It's achievable. I'm going to be talking about it in the coming days. Because with reform, we can get there. We should, we should demand the best health care. I was in Australia just recently, talking in front of a group of, of political folk. And I said that the government had just announced a great target, 14 days, and you can see a GP, and that's a promise. They laughed at me. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh. They said, there'd be riots if you couldn't see a doctor within a day. So we've got to reform our public services. Uh, and then also, we've got to reform some of the institutions, the waste and absurdity of the BBC. But most importantly, the... Hang on now, for the BBC, now what does that mean? The so, waste and absurdity, what, no licence well, fee? I, absolutely. The BBC needs to stand on its own two feet. It does some amazing mm. programmes and films and documentaries and stuff, and it commissions stuff. Some of it's amazing. Some of it is a complete waste of taxpayers' cash, right? So, for all their amazing stuff, then have a service that people pay for and elect to pay for, in the same way you elect to pay for Netflix or Amazon Video mm. or Prime or whatever. So the BBC, it's got a great global brand name. Fine, stand on your own two feet, mm. but don't force us to pay for people like Gary Lineker, Lineker to earn over a million quid a year. It's a nonsense. Mm. So that's got to change. Then the biggest and worst of them all, leave aside all the quangos that are everywhere, many of which need scrapping, are just a complete waste of time and money. But the most obscene of all is the cronyism of the House of Lords, mm. which has to go. I mean, the abuse from recent Tory Prime Ministers, Boris Johnson, you know, we're still seeing the consequences of that. You know, a couple of million quid and it's a peerage here. If you're a family member, it's a peerage there. It's, it's literally obscene. So, you so, would, what, so you'd you've get got rid to scrap. Yeah, you've got to scrap the House of Lords mm. and have a proper national debate mm. about the nature of a second chamber. Personally, um, I think we should have a second chamber, but there's a whole variety of ways of constituting it. You certainly want you don't want it to compete with, in my view, the House of Commons. You do want smart, wise people who've been around the block a few times. But you do, I don't think you want lifers. You do want to make sure, possibly, that you have uh, regional um, regional representation and the right sort of skills there. And there's there's a proper discussion to do that. Mm -hmm. We should we should absolutely do that. The idea of buying peerages is 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 outrageous. You mentioned about you know just reforming uh, uh, reforming institutions and procedures. Uh, Classic one, obviously, and also people always say, yes, I would vote for reform, I would vote for reform, but with our system, don't stand a chance. Obviously, I was in UKIP, uh, what was it, four million the votes. System, absolutely. So one, I, I so should have mentioned it, exactly. Yeah. One of our key things is proportional representation. And I genuinely am excited that we're very close to it. I think we're within three years of it. Mm. So uh, my prediction is that after the next election, PR will come with within a year. The only people now who don't want PR is the Tory party. Mm. The Labour Party have just voted for it a couple of months ago at their conference. Starmer classically is sitting on the fence. It's sort of, sort of his nature. But uh, there are other senior people in the Labour Party who are very committed to it. Look, when I knock on doors, people say, yeah, Richard, I like what you stand for, but it's a wasted vote. Mm. You hear that all the time. With PR, there's no such thing 
as a wasted vote. There's another great benefit of PR. Turnout would go up between 5 and 10% within a matter of a, a few years because people know that their vote is not wasted. I think that our vote share would double over, almost overnight and we could then play a significant role in, uh, in, in terms of the number of seats that we have at the subsequent election. We're mm. And here's the thing with, with PR. We're potentially at a game-changing moment in our democratic history where we may be seeing the dying days of the last majority Tory government in our lifetime. PR comes in, frankly, then uh, we're in the ascendancy. And I think people increasingly are, are liking the message we hear. They know that we mean what we say, unlike the Tories. Then I think we could have a huge role to play. Massive. So, but would you ultimately like to, rather like happened in Canada, do you know, would you actually like to uh, just replace the Tory party? I mean, for the first time, this has been a, a theme for a long time. Peter Hitchens is always talking about it. The Tory party needs to go. We need to have a proper Conservative party. Um, but, but uh, is that what you I, I want a proper competent structure and party mm -hmm. running this great country of ours and the, the, some of our policies actually uh, peter would someone like peter hitchens would say that's not not conservative mm -hmm. for example on critical infrastructure on our utilities we shouldn't allow unbridled unlimited foreign ownership mm -hmm. of monopolistic utilities there's a much better structure. There's a reason why all our utilities and energy costs is so high. Much of it is because huge quantities of it now is foreign owned and they're making vast profits, monopolistic profits. What you should have is a structure where you've got 50% public ownership, 50% owned by British pension funds on behalf of British pensioners with private sector management. That is a win-win-win situation. Now, Traditional conservatives, free market ideologues will say, no, no, that's horrific. You've just got to let the market talk. Well, the market's spoken and it's failed. And if markets are allowed to overreach themselves in an uncontrolled way, that's what happens. Mm. And where you've got essentially monopolies, it's not right that the electricity infrastructure of the south of England and the southeast and London is owned by a Chinese billionaire mm. making vast profits. It's not right that an Australian private equity group right, should own the gas transmission network of the UK, making vast profits. That's literally pro potentially happening as we speak. You know, this is, the Americans don't allow it, the French don't allow it. Why in heavens would we allow it? Mm -hmm. It's not a coincidence that we're paying such huge sums for this stuff. The water companies, essentially a monopoly. So if you have the structure I've just mentioned, in a good year, where the company does well, then the taxpayer does well. In a bad year, we all take it on the chin. And that happens with businesses. So, but it's privately sector management, because remember, governments are very good at funding things. They're very bad at managing things. Mm. So you don't want to let civil servants anywhere near managing the thing. You want private sector management, but you want the, 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 a bit of public ownership so that when it's run well, yeah. right, we all benefit. Mm. Um. You said uh, earlier that you know that you built your company up first and everything, then got involved in politics. Um, if you go back to your twenty-two-year-old, twenty-one-year-old self, say, um, I mean, would you have seen yourself doing this? And also, for that matter, would you have seen Britain being in the situation it is now? It's regrettably, it's quite a long time ago, and I'm just yeah, having yeah, to think yeah, back. Yeah. Um, uh, so I look. I had an interest. I mm. I read the newspapers, and it's sort of I'm not sure many students do read actual sort no. of paper copies now. But oh no, they don't. Uh, they don't. I uh, certainly my children they're that age don't. Uh, look, I I had a, a, a real interest in current affairs mm. actually from school. Mm. So it was in school? it was in the blood. Where was your uh, school? I went to a school in the Midlands called Uppingham. Oh yeah, and. Uh, so I had a good time there. Then went to university up in Manchester in Salford, and uh, that that taught me a lot. Mm. Taught me a huge amount, and hopefully sort of kept me reasonably grounded. And but yeah, I've just had a a growing interest mm. in in how things are done, and just want to try and try and help. 
try and play a role. And but it's none of this stuff is easy. And in a sense, it shouldn't be easy. One should be held to account and uh, and challenged on this stuff. The problem with the first past the post system, and there are very few countries now that have it. I think in Europe, mm. I think we're in slightly embarrassing, humiliating company with Belarus is the only two that have got a first past the post for their main legislature. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't really allow for new people with new ideas. Mm. Competition's good. Look what's happened in Italy, mm. where Giorgio Maloney and the Brothers of Italy party, 4% in 2018, 27% now, she's Prime Minister. Do you admire her, I'm Maloney? She, she's, she's clearly a great patriot. She's socially conservative. Mm. She believes in family values. Mm. But the... The liberal lefty media here describe it, oh, what an absolutely extraordinary far right. Mm, 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 mm. Lord nonsense. Mm. She's, she's a, she believes in her country. She wants it to be properly run. And she wants to protect and defend and grow Italian values in the same way that I think uh, we do at Reform. And I think most patriots in this country want to do. We want to dilute it. We want to, we want to strengthen it so that we become ever more admired around the world, ever more successful. But the real people who need to be the beneficiaries of that is the British people. Mm. And in a sense, I'm in a position to try and do something about it. Most people are not. Ordinary people just trying to get through the daily, the day, the week, put food on the table for the kids. It's, in, it's sort of impossible to get involved in politics. Um, I'm lucky enough that, that I can. I'm just trying to do my bit. Well, I mean, all the very best, Richard, for that. I mean, uh, we actually got a, uh, on that note, we'll finish, but we actually have got a few questions for our members for you, if you just stay there. But in the meantime, look, thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we'll roll on 2024, I guess. Um, that's it for, so what you're saying is this week, we should be back next time. Thank you. Hello. If you're enjoying the New Culture Forum channel and you believe in our mission, may I invite you to join our membership scheme at the link below or on our website, newcultureforum.org.uk. Our work is more important now than ever, and we have great plans ahead for the future, but we can't do it without your support. From as little as three pounds per month, you can help ensure that we continue on our mission. As a member, you'll receive a range of benefits, including access to exclusive content, invitations to our private events, including here at our studios, free copies of our books, and much, much more, including, of course, our famous NCF mug. If you aren't able to become a member, then please help us by clicking this button and subscribing to our channel. It's completely free. Just remember, to also click the bell icon so that you can get notifications when we post new videos. Thank you.